spy satellites would watch the world below, detect Soviet missiles blasting off, compute the position and speed of each missile, alert battle stations in space on Earth. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob Bowman, Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Air Force, retired. My Ph.D. is in aeronautics and nuclear engineering from Caltech. I flew 101 combat missions in Vietnam and directed all the Star Wars programs under Presidents Ford and Carter when their existence was secret. I'm national commander of the Patriots, a nonprofit organization devoted to a government which follows the Constitution, honors the truth, and serves the people. For the last couple of years of the Bush administration, one of the main goals of our organization, the Patriots, was to prevent an attack on Iran. I even wrote a letter to the Pentagon in September 2007 reminding the commanding generals and admirals that their oath of office is to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Their oath is not to obey any order, no matter what. As a matter of fact, in the Nuremberg Principles, which the United States established at the end of World War II, we specifically state that soldiers of all ranks have not only the right but the duty to refuse an illegal order. And we executed Nazis who did the wrong thing. And their defense was they were just following orders. In that letter to the Pentagon, I told them that if Dick Cheney or somebody comes down to the Pentagon and says, go nuke Iran, they should not only refuse that order, they should arrest whoever gave it as a war criminal. Now that was 2007. Uh, here we are a couple years later, and Iran is still on the table. It's true that we have perhaps uh, folks in charge now who are less likely to go off half-cocked and nuke Iran. But their threat of military action is still there. And what's worse, we have the Vice President of the United States essentially giving Israel a green light to go do the dirty work themselves. And I think that's wrong. I think the word that we should be giving Israel, both publicly and privately, is if they initiate aggressive war against Iran or anybody else, that all U.S. aid for Israel will cease immediately. For the last 27 years, I've been a full-time truth teller. And this has not endeared me to the establishment. Uh, I have been uh, subject to bribes, blackmail, death threats, FBI, CIA, and IRS harassment, uh, three audits in two years. And what for? For telling the truth. As a matter of fact, when I blew the whistle on Reagan's Star Wars scheme or attempting to deploy offensive weapons disguised as defense for the purpose of 
uh, regaining absolute military superiority and allowing the United States to execute a first strike against the Soviet Union, aggressive war, uh, a war crime, and uh, only lose 20 million Americans in the process. That was their definition of victory. Well, <clears throat> I, I did speak out against it, and most of that was at the specific request of Reagan's own Joint Chiefs of Staff. I'd been speaking out on Star Wars and telling the truth in bits and pieces and uh, briefing members of Congress and senators on what was happening. And in 1982, uh, several of my articles on Star Wars were published in the Congressional Record. But then in 1983, Reagan gave his infamous Star Wars speech in which he pretended to invent the whole thing. And shortly after that, Reagan's own Joint Chiefs of Staff called me into the Pentagon and pleaded with me to warn Congress and the American people about this military lunacy. And that's their words, not mine. You see, there was a gag order imposed by the Reagan administration on all military, all on active duty, and all those who retired during Reagan's administration. The only reason they had no hold on me was because I retired before Reagan took office. So the JCS said, you know, Bob, you directed all the Star Wars programs. You know what's going on. Very few people in the world do. And you can tell folks. Uh, they pleaded with me also to warn uh, the senators about what the Reagan administration was planning on doing with the shuttle, and that's testing Star Wars weapons, weapons designed to be fired from space against targets on the surface of the Earth, hitting them without warning, destroying hard targets like missile silos and command bunkers totally without warning. They wanted to test this out of the space shuttle, and the JCS thought this is going to confirm all the fears of the Soviet Union that the shuttle is just a weapon. So I did. I went to Congress and told the story and I gave over 5,000 public lectures against Reagan's Star Wars speech. Uh, there were a lot of great adventures at that time. One of the, those speeches was in Moscow where I debated Star Wars against uh, U.S. Ambassador to the Soviet Union, Jack Matlock, who had been one of Reagan's chief arms control negotiators. And uh, after I devastatingly convinced everybody, including Matlock, that uh, Star Wars would be absolutely useless as a defense against a Soviet attack, he admitted that, but said, wouldn't you like to have Star Wars if uh, Gaddafi got the bomb? And I said, no, if I was a, a, a terrorist or a rogue dictator and finally got my hands on enough plutonium to make a homemade bomb, the last thing in the world I would do would be to start a 15-year development program to build me an ICBM. I would just float that nuke up the Potomac on a barge or fly it into Red Square in a Cessna. Well, the whole audience, 4,000 physicians from around the world, erupted in laughter and applause. You see, at that moment, Matthias Roost's Cessna was sitting there in Red Square. We had watched it the night before. I was probably the first person in Moscow to see it coming. We watched it circle three times trying to land, and then when the people cleared out of the way, finally landed in Red Square. And he stood there for half an hour signing autographs, uh, waiting uh, for the police to show up and arrest him. Later that evening, uh, again this was the night before my debate with Matlock, I was at the rooftop restaurant of the Rosia Hotel overlooking Red Square and there was Matthias Ruth Cessna still sitting there in Red Square. But in the background there were fireworks going off all around the city. It was Frontier Day. The Soviets 
were celebrating the vigilance of their border guards. So you can understand where when I talked the next day about just flying their nuke into Red Square in a Cessna, uh, this was very interesting. To every, it was even written up in the New Yorker magazine. So Star Wars was the time I really came out uh, against uh, the establishment in a big way and became a full-time troublemaker and whistleblower. Uh, I'd had opportunities in the past. The first time I recognized that the government could lie to the American people was over the assassination of John F. Kennedy. I mean, I think that anyone who watches the film of Kennedy's head snapping back from the impact of the fatal shot and his wife climbing on the back of the car to retrieve parts of his skull. For them to believe that the only shots came from behind, from a lone gunman in the school book depository, is ludicrous. Just as ludicrous as someone who hears the BBC broadcasting news of the collapse of Building 7 20 minutes before it happens and seeing film of that building, 47-story building, coming down in what appears to be a perfect controlled demolition of an intact building with no visible fires. To see that and believe the Bush administration's official conspiracy theory about 9-11. The difference is that in 1963, we still had some free press. And almost everyone alive at that time heard about the grassy knoll. But by 2001, the corporate monopoly media was tight as a drum. And almost no one has heard of Building 7, much less seen videos of it that absolutely prove that the stories we have been told by our government are out and out lies and physical impossibilities. Building 7 I often hear about. No plane hit Building 7. Why did Building 7 come down? What do you tell people? What is Building 7? Or what it was it Building 5 or the building that wasn't hit by the plane? Building 7. I have no idea. I've never heard that. We're in a situation now where most of the American people have been uh, hoodwinked by the big lies of our government. And a great many people who actually work in the government are likewise hoodwinked by those big lies. Some of the people who tell those lies even believe in them. Well, it's time that those of us who know the truth speak it out frequently and loudly we must convince the American people and people in our government and even the President of the United States that these lies and the evil deeds which flow from them are destroying this nation and that they must rise up, all of us must rise up as one and say no, no to the lies, no to the myths, no to the evil actions, no to the Patriot Act, no to the wars of aggression, and no to taking away our liberties given us in the Constitution. We must tell the truth because only the truth can preserve this nation and restore our freedom. Now, having fought Star Wars for so many years and having succeeded in keeping weapons out of space, I've been very, very concerned about the expansion of so-called missile defense into Eastern Europe, encircling the Soviet Union, or what is now Russia. Uh, missiles in Poland, radars in Czechoslovakia, these, I don't believe, have a legitimate purpose in protecting Europe or anybody else from 
nuclear missiles from Iran. Russia, as bad as they are now, having backslidden from democracy, they have a legitimate concern about those missiles in Poland. And my hope is that Obama, who so far is letting this lunacy continue, will, and I've heard he's going to review the policy, and I certainly hope he does, because there are much better and cheaper ways and less threatening ways of defending against nukes from Iran. And I hope that Obama's review scuttles the missiles in Poland and the radar in Czechoslovakia. Yeah, I know we've promised those countries money. We've given all sorts of uh, stuff to them in order to be able to uh, deploy those weapons. Well, give them the money, but don't deploy the weapons because they make nuclear war more likely and they do not promote our national security. Now, many who voted for Obama are shocked and saddened by what is going on now. Uh, I'm not surprised because we knew before Obama was elected that his mentor, his foreign policy advisor, was Zbigniew Brzezinski. Uh, someone who comes from the old Chicago school that Brzezinski and Kissinger and all those folks had an inside track to Obama's ear. And so it isn't surprising that the chess game that Obama is playing is carrying out what Brzezinski wrote about years and years ago. We need to, again, reach out to Obama uh, and certainly to our so-called representatives in Congress who unfortunately don't represent us but the big money interests that feed them. We must reach out and say no to this chess game. Uh, it is dangerous. It uh, doesn't promote our security. It uh, weakens it. And it is only designed to support imperial aims. And those imperial aims are not for the United States of America. They are using the United States of America to promote an imperialism of these global elites, multinational corporations, and banks. We don't want to live under a world government of the corporations, by the corporations, and for the corporations. The United States must return to a constitutional foreign policy where we seek not to be king of the hill nor subservient to the World Trade Organization, but simply seek to be a sovereign responsible member of the family of nations, nothing more and nothing less. When I ran for president in 2006, I discovered that there was not much difference between conservative Republicans and liberal Democrats, that those on the far left and the far right had the same concerns, the same issues, the same problems with our government. Both love our country but fear our government with good reason. Sometimes the left and the right use different language to discuss the same things. But we're one people and we need to understand that we have been artificially divided for far too long. The global elites have divided us into Democrat and Republican left and right, conservative and liberal. They have divided us with hot button issues like abortion and gay rights and gun control and prayer in schools. 
And by doing so, they have given us, the electorate, the illusion that we have a choice. When in reality, both the Republican and Democratic parties are owned by the same global elites. And on issues that matter to those global elites, they act as one. When it comes to conducting a war of aggression for an oil pipeline, there's no difference between Democrat and Republican. When it comes to signing a trade deal to drive down wages and increase profits of the corporations, there's no difference between Republican and Democrat. Remember, it was Bill Clinton who gave us NAFTA and it was Al Gore, the hero of the environmental movement, who was the hatchet man for the Clinton administration to cram NAFTA down the throats of a reluctant Congress. This is not a party issue. This is not a left-right issue. The question is not, should we have big government or little government? The question is, who should government serve? And it should serve the people. And it hasn't been doing it. And it still isn't doing it. And changing from Republican to Democrat or Democrat to Republican is not going to change that. The only thing that will change that is the American people understanding the truth, understanding what's happened to them, understanding that their wages now are a third of what they were in the 1950s, understanding that they have been stolen from massively, not by the government in taxes, but by the corporations with overhead and profits. The overhead and profits of the, that the corporation makes on the back of workers is about 200 times what the government takes in taxes. And the American people, having been educated as to the truth, then have to rise up and demand and get a government that starts serving them. We need a change, and it isn't going to come from Democrats and Republicans. It has to come from the American people. The enemy we face is not a Democratic president or a Republican president. It's a global conspiracy. Yes, a conspiracy. Whenever more than two people get together to plan evil, illegal deeds, it is a conspiracy. And that's what we're facing. Uh, the, at the top of this conspiracy are a, a handful of ultra-wealthy multi-billionaires in the world. Some of them have been conspiring for more than a century. Their tools are the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderbergers, the Trilateral Commission. And they have tools in other countries as well. And then, of course, there are thousands of think tanks and entities which serve their purposes. Their ultimate goal is to get all power unto themselves and to enrich themselves beyond all reason. Well, most of them are already wealthy beyond all reason, but the more wealth the, you get, it seems, the more you want. And they're never satisfied. They want more. More wealth and more power. And this drive causes them to want absolute control over us, the people. That's not what America was founded to be. We were founded to be a government 
where the people are sovereign. And we must be that again. There's been a dangerous trend lately of uh, the government co-opting churches and their clergy and using them to push their nefarious schemes to uh, uh, round up the American people, especially us dissenters, and to get rid of us. What the clergy needs to do is to tell their people, number one, about the nonviolent Jesus. And if they just can't bring themselves to preach nonviolence, at least teach them the just war principles which have been violated in every one of our conflicts through our lifetimes. And tell your people that participation in wars which do not follow the just war principles are sinful and immoral and every bullet they fire is another nail in the body of Jesus. If you can't tell your people that, why don't you just take off your collar, put down your Bible, and get an honest job? The Constitution, and in particular the First Amendment, is the source of what we now call separation of church and state. It means that the state doesn't mess with the churches and the churches don't mess with the state. Uh, as 501c3s, churches may not uh, come out in favor or against particular candidates for office or particular pieces of legislation. They can't tell their people vote against bill number so-and-so. At the same time, the government must not use the churches to set forth their nefarious schemes of control. This is totally against the First Amendment to the Constitution. All too often, we, the people, have been allowed ourselves to be manipulated by fear. Fear of terrorism, fear of economic collapse, fear of swine flu, for goodness sakes. And they have things that they want to feed us to cure these ills. And, of course, this means more control. We see in their solutions some horrible things. The uh, complete takeover of agriculture by Archer Daniels, Midland, and Monsanto, for example. Uh, in their food safety regulations which they want passed, they're going to practically eliminate the family farmer. And when it comes to animals, livestock, even pets, they want a national ID for all of those animals. And they want a small farmer who takes a, a cow or a pig to the county fair to show him, they have to fill out paperwork every time one of their animals leaves their property. Uh, they want to mate with the bull next door, got to report it to the federal government. Uh, they're making it impossible for small farmers to obey the rules and to own any livestock. But it's interesting, the big growers, the big livestock raisers, like Tyson Chicken, for example, are totally exempt from these new regulations. We must educate the people so that the people just pound the members of Congress until we get this kind of stuff killed. We can't afford to have the government and the giant agribusiness corporations taking over and eliminating all competition. One of the things Monsanto wants and is very near to getting 
is a global monopoly on seeds. If we allow them to make it impossible for farmers to keep their own seeds and reuse seeds year after year because they're fertile and have to use Monsanto's Terminator seeds which have no offspring, uh, then Monsanto rules the world's food supply. This is just one example of the ways in which this new world order is designed to create corporate monopolies in food, in water, in energy, you name it, they want it. And if we allow them to have it, they have absolute power over our lives. I don't know how we're going to do it, but short of squirreling away a few live seeds, retreating to a mountaintop and barricading you from yourself from the rest of the world, growing your own food, uh, generating your own energy. And believe me, we've considered that for our family. Short of that, the only other option is to defeat these global elites, to prevent them getting these monopolies, and to return power to the people. I've got a large family, seven children, 21 grandchildren, four great-grandchildren. My wife keeps talking about having a retreat that we can bring them all to where they'll be safe and where we'll have our own water supply and grow our own food and generate our own energy with windmills. And it sounds great. But if that's what we all do, we abdicate all power to these elites and they'll eventually come get us. We can't do that. We can't give up on America. We can't give up on the Constitution. We can't give up on the truth. We must come together and win this battle. We the people can win. We the people must win. Banning into space, a layered defense to protect the country from nuclear devastation. U.S. spy satellites would watch the world below, detect Soviet missiles blasting off, compute the position and speed of each missile, alert battle stations in space on Earth.